Yo yo yo. We've got so today I wanted to showcase the build that I almost be beat guard. Triple Crown solo as. Um, I posted a video, I'm sorry, it's quite a while ago. I should have made this guide a lot earlier because I promised it. So yeah, very sorry about that. On the upside, the build is slightly improved. As you can see, we're using Sacred Emulation now. Um, I didn't know that back when I played this build. But basically, you can remove the raw damage of Sacred Emulation. So as you can see, there's no raw damage on me. You get the first tick of the raw damage when you activate Sac Sacred Emulation. But then as soon as you activate Clarity of Agony, it just removes the raw damage ticks. So yeah, pretty sturdy build because it has a lot of healing over time. You can always use Lay on Hands for ridiculous heals as well, of course. But yeah, just the healing over time is quite massive. Death take you! I don't know why you're not attacking there. <laughs> What's going on? Are you back? What was that? Death take you! Weird. Not exactly what I was going. Probably should have attacked one of the squishies. They die a lot quicker. That looks like a death take you. Oh, these guys are actually weaker to crash. <laughs> That's weird. That's awkward. Not my Oh, by the way, I also have healing potions, of course. <laughs> so I'm gonna get to the build in a second. Death take you! Now that never happens. Death take you! Bullseye! Death take you! Death take you! Oh, these guys are weak to pierce. Okay, whatever. I'll teach you a lesson. Death take you! Right. So on to the build. So we have an Alpachka gold packed monk paladin. Um, both these subclasses are entirely up to preference. You could go with a Hellwalker, for example. You could go with a Bleak Walker, for example. Also the race, Pale Elf. You could go with almost anything else. Um, it's pretty nice, though, to have these kind of armor ratings. Especially in the DLC. And yeah, I posted a video beating the Beast of Winter Dragon with almost the same build on TCS quite a while ago. Sadly, it's like a month ago, so I'm very sorry that this build is so much later, but I wasn't really feeling that fire for a while because of all the crazy balance fixes and a lot of bugs still unfixed. Even though they nerfed every single item in the game, but they never got around to fix bugs that were there even before the first patch so i was kind of annoyed with it didn't play it a lot i played some Baldur's gate and whatnot but yeah here we are and yeah as i said the build is slightly improved back then i didn't use sacred emulation because i didn't know that the exact combo i was playing already paladin monk can just remove the raw damage so that is really really cool 
Um, so when I create my characters, I always, always start at the bottom and I always go with a dumped resolve all the way down to three base. As you can see, as a couple of buffs we get during the game by getting certain items and also by getting the nature's resolve. So everybody who's played this game before knows nature's resolve is a pressed bonus. So a very important pillar of this build is a minimal rest approach. So right now I rested with Captain's Bucket. And once I am able to create Captain's Bunkhead, I will never rest again. So I will rest with Captain's Bunkhead. Then I go back to the starting island and talk to one of the Dawn Stars to get Dawn Stars Basin. So this is only per rest, but if you never rest, you never lose this. And the same goes with Nature's Resolve. You go to Tikivara and there's like on the eastern side of the island, there's a scripted interaction where you can either fight a couple of mushrooms and um, Pugra or whatever they're called, one of those weird tree persons or you can talk to a friend you can ask her if she needs help and she will offer you a mushroom to eat and if you eat that there will be no fight but you will get nature's resolve which is really big with 10 accuracy but it also gives you two resolve which is not as big just so people know why a three base resolve looks like this and i as i say to get these points right, mainly to get the might score right, I always start at the bottom, dump resolve all the way. I max intellect, so 18 base, and perception is class dependent, but basically what I want is when I sit at character creation and don't have any of these buffs shown yet, I want it to be a 14. So since I'm an elf that gets plus one, it's a 13 base. But if you have something that doesn't give you perception then you'll have a 14 base and I max dex so both things that are maxed are intellect and dex both at 18 and also I went with the deadfire archipelago background and for constitution it's class dependent again but basically in this case it's an 8 base because I don't have any constitution bonus but once again you want there to be an 8 at character creation and this is why I started at the bottom, because this is totally class dependent what the might base is going to be again. So all the remaining points, all the points I have not spent after maxing both decks and int will go into might. Which also helps a healing, so might is not as bad as some people think. And this build is very heal based. So another reason why I'm going with C no rest approach or limited rest approach that I don't rest once I get all these per rest abilities is because I can get an injury and keep it pretty much forever and I can either get this injury which you get when you enter Kehopa's Fang so if you enter the area previous to this area but of course that's a pretty dangerous area um, but you can also go to Trap Island, so basically all the way down southwest on the map there is an island. You have a, a fight with Aoten on that island on like the western corner, but you also in the north eastern corner you also have a place that's just filled with traps. And you have traps like down to your right. And you have traps in the middle when you go upwards, northwards. And those traps, there's like small traps and there's white traps. And the white traps are all fire traps. So if you go over one of those traps, you will 
there will be a fireball on screen and you have to run towards the fireball so it can hit you and if you get hit if you don't like reflex safe against it so it's important to get rid of your shield when you want to do that there's several of those traps so if you don't get hit by the first one or the second one you can always keep retrying you will eventually get hit if you don't have a shield equipped so that is by the way the reason my triple crown solo character died uh, i foolishly walked over this trap because i was gonna get the cloak back here that makes you immune to fire damage and i was being cocky and i thought okay my 75 stride is a good injury i don't really need to get rid of that because stride isn't really important but i want an even better injury and a flame injury would give me minus two burn armor rating and i think one dex or something like that so the idiot i was i tested this before i did this on triple crown i tested this and running over this trap did not do anything to me except give me a wound so I tried that again in Triple Crown, even though I didn't have to, and I failed, and I got three injuries. I couldn't disarm the trap because I didn't have any thieves putty with me. I didn't have enough alchemy, uh, enough mechanics to do it without thieves putty. This has changed now in this build. In this build, just with gloves, you get 10 mechanics. So even without these, but you can disarm these traps. And also the beast of winter traps are all like 10 mechanics. So I think this is a better mechanic score for this build. Because our main thing that we're going to be maxing is alchemy. And if I went with 6 mechanics, which is the absolute minimum, you would have to go. Because you kind of need to disarm some traps. There's just some traps you don't want to take, especially if you don't want to rest. And if you don't want to use Luminous Adra potions to remove all your injuries because you want to keep one injury. And the reason why we're keeping injuries is mainly because of these gloves. This build is very heal based and with these gloves you can't get anti-healed. Which is important against these Nagas I just showed. They can reduce your heal by an extra 100% so you don't heal anymore. If you fight these guys and you're not immune to constitution affliction you will die quickly and painfully. And of course the flame cloak that I talked about that you get here in this area it makes you immune to fire damage and it also makes you heal 20% of the time 10 or 20% of the time of the fire damage. So for example the fire dragon I can't do shit for you once you have that cloak. And another item I use which is not as important but it's cool to have and better than other helmets if you have an injury you can't be interrupted. So yeah that's the reason for the no rest approach. Um, you have to be careful and you have to know what forced rests are. One of the biggest killers with this no rest approach is a certain ship interaction where you can wait. But it tells you, it's like when they want you to toss money into the water for Ondra and you have several things you can say to them, you can just toss the money overboard and whatnot. But there's also an option where you like give them a ceremony or something tell them I don't know what you exactly do but basically in that interaction you wait and you lose all your rest bonuses so you have to know that whenever you wait for several hours that you are in danger of losing those rest bonuses so this is not something you can play if you haven't played the game before this build will only work in this specific way I build it, it will only work if you know how to avoid resting in dialogues. So yeah, so far Alchemy 20, Mechanics 8, 
because if I had two more alchemy and two less mechanics, I wouldn't really get too much out of it. Right now my white D heals me for 4.1. In this game, heals and damage do get rounded up if it is 0.5 or more, but if it is 0.1, like the white leaf, it will not get rounded up. So I could even go with one less alchemy in this build, because you get 0.1 healing over time from one level in alchemy for white leaf. <coughs> Um, I went with history here in this build. This is just a console created build. Um, mainly to show how bad this cloak actually is. So you get plus 15 to everything but deflection. But you just invested 21 points in history. And if you would wear a greater cloak of protection, you would get plus 10. Which is not the biggest difference. But I personally like to have the cloak of greater deflection. Um, this cloak or a cloak of protection will be good if you go up against arcane dampener. Because you also get plus 10 will out of this. So the more will you have the harder it is for arcane dampener to hit you of course. But most of the time you want this cloak. And of course, if you go up I against the fire dragon, you want the cloak that you get back here, because it makes you fire immune. If you have an injury. But with this build, you always have an injury. I'm not going to talk about all this, I'm going to show the items in a little bit. Just going to slowly scroll through here. And for weapon proficiencies, you get unarmed when... You create your character, you don't have to actually select unarmed, you get it automatically. And the two things you need on top of that is spear and arquebus. So arquebus is for the red hand arquebus. I recently made a video about that. It's a video right before the Beast of Winter Run. And basically what the weapon does, it has a couple of upgrades you can select and one of them is destroy a lower level vessel on two consecutive hits. And you can kill risen armsmen with that, risen mages with that. You can pretty much kill all risens with it, which are in my opinion the most annoying undead in the game. Vampires are not as annoying with this build because we are perma rested with Captain's Bunkhead. There is a couple of um, vampires that you can actually kill with the right hand arquebus as well, but it's not reliable. You can't kill all of them with it. But yeah, that's why we have arquebus and we have spear because of this spear. Spear. In my previous build, when I killed the Beast of Winter, I had the spear that you get in the Kraken area, the underwater area. Because back then, before the last patch, that spear gave you pen if you level survival. Which would be ideal for this build, because the leveled history is pretty crap, because the history clo cloak is pretty crap now. But that spear got nerfed, and leveling survival doesn't give you pen on it anymore. So now we have this, because it deals pierce and slash. So that is really, really good if you can't hit something with crash damage or if you just don't have enough pen for crash damage, you can just change to this. So base pen is 11, but we have unlimited tenacious because of this. So it's actually 13 pen. <clears throat> Let's go back to the build for a second before we go more into items. Um, I'm not going to say anything about this because a lot of it is from items and whatnot. And yeah, monk. I don't think anything here is really what you select. There's just core stuff you get with the class. Clarity of Agony at level 4. 
when you get the second level abilities and get the Zelda's auras at level 4 but before you can actually get the upgrade exalted endurance it's not worth going with the Zelda's endurance or whatever it's called it's more worth going with Zelda's focus but once you get the upgrade this is good because of the massive HP you get if you have all the bony that I have right now Um, I went with lightning strikes, but you can also go swift strikes. The reason I went with lightning strikes is mainly because I'm a gold pact, so my sworn rival also gives me armor rating, and the armor rating does not stack with... Um, the other thing than turning wheel, I don't know what it's called, but you get an ability that gives, instead of burn damage, it gives you armor class, and yeah, that doesn't stack with sworn rival, but if you're not a gold pack, maybe you want to go with that. I personally really like the intellect per wound. Because in combat, all my abilities last a lot longer. This, for example, lasts 50 seconds instead of 40, and so on and so forth. And my heal actually gets extra ticks. Both the base and the robust last longer. This lasts like 21 seconds in combat. Because I went with intellect instead of constitution. So yeah, you can go with swift strikes. I went with lightning strikes because I already have a burning lash, so now I have a double lash. I have the lightning lash and the burning lash. I think my weapon also, or my shield also has like a burning lash. Something does. No, it's not the shield. Is it this? Maybe I'm just going crazy. I thought I had a burning lash somewhere. <laughs> right, but yeah. We have the lash from turning wheel anyway. So that's why we went with lightning strikes. Take whatever you prefer. Soul mirror is not something you have to take as early as you get third level monk passives. It's something you can take if you don't know what else to take, basically. It's not the biggest deal if you have it or not. And third level Paladin abilities, I just upgraded the whatever the first version is called, the rival thing. You know what I mean. So this is just the upgrade for it, and also the upgrade for Lay on Hands. That's that. And then Force Level. I showed Clarity of Agony already, didn't I? So yeah, Clarity of Agony, very, very strong. I hope I didn't forget to mention that. So basically that's why Sacred Emulation only ticks for one raw tick. If right after Sacred Emulation we activate this, it takes away the... If you have Lone Wolf Ring, that's also important. Together with Clarity of Agni, it takes away the raw damage ticks from Sacred Emulation. So you take one tick. That's why I healed before I used Sacred Emulation, so I get the Robust on me. And yeah, that's why you get Clarity of Agony. It's also very useful against anything else. Hostile effect durations are always dangerous, especially on Beast of Wind Dead Dragon. This is really strong because it keeps casting spells at you with damage over time. Okay, so yeah, 
Not going with the body part, because constitution would be okay, it's less good than intellect. But yeah, because the gilded amenity doesn't stack with the armor one that you get here for all the body. The other thing that's not turning real. So if you don't go gold packed, maybe you want to go with the armor thing. But once again, the intellect is quite, quite helpful. Then of course Sandra's blows. One of the strongest things about being a monk paladin, or a monk anything I guess, but because it works of wounds, you can just have this up all the time. You will always have plus two penetration, plus five might. Very strong. On the paladin side, of course, as I said, the upgrade exalted endurance. Um, Righteous soul, really, really good. Um, on that level, there's a lot of stuff you can get that is good. Like you get... Uh, practice healer, you get tough. And you also get like 5% crit chance. I don't know what's called right now. Uncanny luck. There we go. So that's all on the same power level as Enervating Blows. Very, very strong. Um, but less strong than the other stuff it competes with. So I would get this last. So I would kind of start with tough. Get tough first on the monk side. Instead of Enervating Blows. But on the Paladin side, definitely go with Righteous Soul. It's just too good. Immunity, Poison, and Disease. And then either go with Uncanny Luck or Enervating Blows next. Enervating Blows is really good against stuff like Beast of Winter Dragons because it heals. And yeah, 6 level, just the upgrade. This isn't really priority to get this. So you can get this last before you get the other stuff, the turning wheel. And on 7th level this, pretty good. It's kind of similar to Swift Strikes. So if you have both Swift Strikes and this, it's pretty good. I don't have both, but... As I said, I just want to combine a couple of lashes. It's totally up to preference. And... Which is Triumph. So this is really, really strong, of course. You already get Zeal back if you mark somebody with Sawn Enemy and they die because of the upgrade. But now on top of yeah, this, every four enemies you kill, you get one Zeal back. And... yeah. Stoic Steel, definitely the first thing you take at level 19. Only take Sacred Emulation last, I would personally say. And what works really good together with Sacred Emulation is Crucible of Suffering. Before you have Sacred Emulation, this is not as strong. But because you remove a hostile effect, the raw damage, with Clarity of Agony, you instantly get that. Consider it done. So yeah, that's the build. Pretty much. Can show the items as well. As I said, these both items only if you have an injury, but I would totally, totally urge you to get these. Charm of Bones is nice. There's a couple of other good necklaces, but plus two intellect. We already have over 30 intellect because of the Model the monk model, and with this it's 32. Five accuracy against vessels is always good. Call the restless can be good against beast of winter. It doesn't always work. Basically, what you want to get in that fight is once you got the beast of winter dragon down to bloodied, and it gets this crazy wizard ability that gives us plus five armor rating. You want to get a Risen Mage or something like that to cast, um, what's it called? 
but yeah, basically casted the spell on it to remove it. But you don't get a risen mage or vampire guaranteed, so it's a little bit random. But the plus two intellect is still very good. Five accuracy against vessels. Most strong enemies in this game are vessels. Now, of course, the lone wolf ring is just for sacred emulation. So before you have sacred emulation, you can take any other ring. Greater regen ring is quite nice because it heals for a lot more than the base. So yeah, it heals for 6 and the base is just 3. That is because of practice healer and Dawnstar Blessing, basically. That's why it heals for twice as much. Um, here I have the blackened plate because as I said this is a console created character but the blackened plate is kind of hard to get I mean if you're not playing TCS it's no big deal you can definitely get this at max level but if you play TCS it might be a bit risky the patinated plate is pretty much as good as this armor the only thing it lacks is like life and death and Death in life, the raw damage, and the healing over time. It's not really giant. It's not the biggest deal. But it's pretty cool to have. But yeah, patinated plate, you get it for free if you have 13? 13 or 15 mechanics. Something like that. Otherwise, you can buy it. And yeah, this, because we're not a fighter, so resistance to dexterity, affliction and resistance to my deflection from the boots because we're already immune to intellect, perception and resolve afflictions once we have captain's bunker. And as I said, I'll never rest after that because we also want to keep the dancer's blessing, the injury and the nature's resolve. There's a couple of other parest things you can get. You can get a bonus from a whore either in Dunnage or in Nekataka and then there's also the place with all the witches where you can get like the witches cauldron and you also get alchemy something when you drink from the pool that's also another stat bonus that only goes away on rest and that's it that's the build I showed the items. Oh yeah, Abram pad. If you have heavy armor, this pad does more than if you have lighter armor. So heavy armor in combination with that is really good. Pretty low recovery on the shield. A bit more recovery on the spear, of course, because spear is slower. But still quite nice because of the Abraham pad. And yeah, poison, you don't really need to use that too often. You need to use that against fire immune enemies where you can't use your sacred emulation, like Rasun uh, fanatics. They are really dangerous to this character if you don't have poison equipped. And yeah, I guess the dragon, but the fire dragon isn't the biggest deal because you can get the fire cloak back here. And that's it. That's the build. And I hope it was helpful. Sorry I was very late, but yeah. Haven't been too interested in that fire for a while just because there was a lot of balance fixes and not enough actual bug fixes and I was a bit frustrated. Builds stopped working after a patch because everything got messed up but at the same time bugs that were in the game from the start like the giant cave grab swallows you and never spits you out. It's still in the game which is pretty insane. <laughs> never got fixed. So that's why I played a lot on stream, I played a lot of Baldur's Gate and yeah, a lot of not Pillars of Eternity. But that's it and I hope this build is helpful. For me personally this is 
the best character combination long paladin i've played so far i've tried a lot of builds i've tried a lot of classes and i think this is definitely the strongest build to do tcs with but yeah i might still have overlooked something i did play what many people think is very strong as paladin enchanter multi-class i did play that myself and i think it's a lot weaker than this because summons don't have a lot of pen they can help you take less damage but you could just instead of sacred emulation you could just take the monk duplicates they're not really that different from shanta summons so i personally don't think a shanta paladin is stronger than a monk paladin at all and yeah hope you enjoyed it and thanks for watching See you around.